This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, so I can see us there. So, folks, everybody's welcome to the this afternoon's executive office uh, committee. Uh, if we could start with apologies, clerk, do we have any apologies at all, Michael? No, no, chair. At the moment, okay, that's grand. Um, in terms of item two, chairperson's root business, the only item that I had, although I see that he's not here, was to take the opportunity to congratulate the um, Vice Chair, Deputy Chair, Doug Beatty, on becoming leader of the Ulster Unionist Party. Um, maybe if uh, Doug joins us at some point later in the meeting, we'll be able to um, pass on those, those good uh, wishes to him at that stage. Uh, if we move on then to item three, uh, the draft minutes, they are in the meeting packet page six. Are members content that they are a true reflection of the proceedings from last week? Oh. Yeah. Okay, that's grand, so that's them sorted. Um, then in terms of item four, uh, matters arising, um, maybe just to say that at our meeting last week, we did discuss the possibilities of inviting the EU Vice President, uh, Mara Sefikic, and Lord Frost to attend the committee uh, to deal with some of the issues that we had. But that was not agreed just because there was a technical problem at that point. So what I'm actually just seeking is agreement that we invite those uh, those guys to the meeting. So would people be happy enough for that? Yes. Yeah, I think there was agreement to it last week, but we just didn't get the official bit of doing that. So, so that certainly helps us to be able to do that. Um, we also need agreement to write to the Finance Committee about our spe the spending plan of the department, which was uh, presented to us last week, and we did reach a couple of conclusions in that, but just to seek agreement to table those issues that we had raised to the Finance Committee. Uh, would members be happy? Great. Yep. Okay, thank you. And then finally, just agreement to write to the Economy Committee about um, the impact uh, upon businesses to date by the protocol um, and just ways to move forward. Just to bring people back, do you remember um, that we had a meeting with the uh, EU Joint EU Committee and the Oireachtas and what they had suggested was that we should engage with businesses that they would be keen to hear and we agreed that we would be keen to hear some of the experiences of businesses and um, some of the opportunities that are available to them at the moment. But obviously business is within the realms of the economy committee. So it's just a right to them to ask if they've done any work on this already and how we could dovetail that into what we would be doing going forward. So would there be agreement just to check in with the economy department on that? Great. Okay. Uh, then that quickly has got us on to item five, which is uh, the historical institutional abuse. It's an oral evidence session uh, from the Victims and Survivors Service. Members on pages 16 to 22 of the meeting pack are the relevant papers. Um, if we could bring into uh, the meeting Margaret Bateson and Oliver Wilkinson, uh, that's the Chief Executive Officer of the Victim and Survivor Service and the Chair of the Victims and Survivors Service. And if we had... I think we have Margaret on the line, maybe, or do we have her in per per Oh, we have you in person as well. Yeah, okay. So, Margaret, yourself and Oliver, you're very welcome um, to the committee. We appreciate you coming today to give us an update on the service and how it's been going in the past period in relation to, to the historical institutional abuse uh, and, the, uh, and uh, what services ha have been offered. Um, I'll maybe pass over to yourselves if you want to give us a bit of an introduction to how things have been going, and then we can open it up to questions after that. Okay, well, thank you for the invitation to be here today to brief the committee on our work with survivors of historical institutional abuse. I am Oliver Wilkinson, the chair of the VSS, and I'm joined today with our chief executive, Margaret Bateson. We've provided you with a briefing paper on progress to date, and we're happy to respond to any questions that you have. But there are a few points that I'd like to bring to the committee's attention. The first is around the launch of this dedicated and specialist service. 
Victim and Survivor Service was appointed by the Executive Office on the 23rd of October 2020 to provide health and well-being support and services to survivors of historical institutional abuse. Now, I'd like to thank our staff for their commitment and hard work over that short period of about six weeks to get the service launched by the 1st of December 2020. I'd also like to thank the HIA groups who work closely with us and continue to work closely with us to, get, to make sure that we get this service right. We'll continue to be victim-centred in our approach and ensure that the service delivery model both drives and is driven by our own vision, which is to improve the health and well-being of victims and survivors. The second point is around the impact of COVID-19 on support and services. To date, COVID-19 has impacted on how support and services can be delivered, in particular, the social support and complementary therapies. It is also a challenge to start off a service providing things like welfare support and psychological therapies and do so remotely instead of face-to-face. -face. Uh, as you can appreciate, this makes it much more difficult to build up that much-needed trust and uh, relationship. We're grateful for the continued patience and understanding of survivors through all this. I'm pleased to advise, however, that our offices will be open from the 24th of May uh, later this month on an appointment basis and that face-to-face -face support and services will be available from our community partners, We have Trauma Centre and Advice NI from that date. Thirdly, it might be useful to provide clarity on the types of support and service available and how these can be accessed. These uh, services now include two health and well-being case workers who are available to discuss and assess individual needs and ensure access to specialist services, psychological therapies, complementary therapies and social support, welfare support and advice and finally opportunities to undertake personal development and training. If any survivor needs access to services, they can get that by contacting the Wave Trauma Centre, Advice NI, or the VSS, Victim and Survivor Service, directly. We are now all here to help. There are two areas of support that we are currently transitioning across from our colleagues in Cossica. The first is helping to record the survivor's lived experience. <clears throat> this may be for the purposes of a redress application, but equally, this could be for family, personal or therapeutic use. This work ha had been carried out by the Interim Advocates Office, but will now transition to VSS as part of the service delivery model. The second is around information retrieval. This is a particularly challenging area. Under the legislation, COSICA has the remit for information retrieval and will do so where there is, for example, a public interest case. Day-to-day -day information retrieval will form part of the VSS service delivery model over the coming weeks. Now, I'd like to finish with a comment on our commitment to learning and to the principles of co-design. We have provided some information in terms of 148 survivors who have come forward to VSS to date in terms of their initial needs. We are in the very early stages, but starting to capture information in this way provides important data and evidence to continue to shape and develop the services in the long term. Corporate governance and clinical governance framework, frameworks also un underpin the work of VSS and our community partners, supported by clear quality standards and a monitoring and evaluation framework, which adopts an outcome-focused approach to every intervention. 
Fiona Ryan has recently started as Commissioner and will have a monitoring and oversight role of the support and services that we provide. Engagement to date with her has been very constructive, collaborative and survivor-centred. We look forward to working with Fiona as a critical friend over the months and the years ahead. And finally, learning from the lived experience of victims of survivors is equally as important and remains a key priority. We look forward to our continued engagement with survivors themselves to co-design our services. Their input to date has been invaluable. All of this will be an ongoing process for us. Working collectively, we know we can provide better support and services to survivors of historical institutional abuse. Um, I'm happy to hand over chair to any questions that the committee might have, most of which I presume Margaret will be able to address directly. Okay, Oliver, thank you very much indeed for that and for that background information and for the very important role and work that the organisation does. And it's been uh, re really good to get the update. The committee, as I'm sure you will be aware, ha has taken a very keen interest in the area of historical institutional abuse from we got back together last January uh, and we have been conducting a series of um, discussions with all the various uh, stakeholders within that, so we appreciate yourselves coming to us today. Um, we engaged recently with a number of the sectoral groups, uh, representative groups um, of the, the, the victims and survivors, and we were listening to the things that they were saying. And some of the, the two, two points that I want to go to, the first is in relation to just how COVID uh, cut across the service delivery. And I was wondering if you could tell us, was there any interactions between yourselves and the department to try and maintain service delivery and maybe to even have it deemed as essential or exempt from certain of the regulations so that that therapeutic and supportive work could continue during COVID? Yeah, it might, um, first of all, be useful just to outline maybe the support and services that, that are, are available and then the impact of COVID on those. Um, so uh, the health and wellbeing uh, services available, we look at health and wellbeing in the whole. So what the individual needs in terms of um, social support, psychological support and emotional support. So when we talk about health and wellbeing, we're talking about access to a health and wellbeing caseworker to complementary therapies, to psychological therapies, and to pain management um, and, and physiotherapy, things like that. We also think about welfare and financial advice and the impact that that can have on your on your well-being. So when we say health and well-being, we mean welfare advice and support as well. We also mean social support in terms of outreach, befriending, social isolation activities, and then finally personal development around training. And the impact on COVID of each of those is different. So, for example, under psychological therapies, we were able to um, continue those remotely, either by telephone or by Zoom. Um, and 32 individuals are engaged with a therapist and have been engaged with a therapist even during COVID. On the others, it's difficult because you're balancing government regulations alongside the professional regulations. So there were different periods of time, for example, where physiotherapy couldn't be provided according to the physiotherapist professional standards or complementary therapies could not. So we didn't engage with the department in terms of can we make these things exempt for every single intervention. We tried to act as fast as we could as different professional standards and different restrictions allowed. And we tried to do what we could. The two areas most impacted, without a doubt, were around social support. I mean, social support, even the words tell you, it needs social connection, you know, and those social connections we know um, and the comfort come from face to face and you can build a lot more trust and relationships face to face. So those will be starting up from next week um, in, a, in a local community um, setting and likewise welfare advice was taking place really remotely and we'll start um, face to face. 
In terms of BSS and the offices, it was quite frustrating for us as well. Um, we'd done a lot of engagement with the HIA groups throughout the summer, and some of those engagements we were able to do face to face, others um, on Zoom. And then we brought all of the HIA groups in to see the office and help us design it. You know what what would a welcoming environment look like? Um, and then, if you remember, that was all happening at the end of November, ready for the big launch on the first of December. We were as excited as the HIA groups. Um, to open our doors and then that was the last week where everything shut down again so again we couldn't physically open the doors we had to remove go to remotely as well okay there were incredibly frustrating times for everybody right across all sectors i suppose is the is, is the key message it wasn't just something here it was all sectors were being restricted in, in the work that they could do. And look, finally for me, in terms of the, the, the groups and listening to them and working with them, um, there, there does seem to be a real pattern emerging that there are um, serious issues to do with mental health and, and, and you know, addressing the mental health needs uh, of those within the sector. Um, do, do, do you have like some sort of special measure that you're keeping a track specifically on that to make sure that you're addressing it, checking what the needs are, securing additional resources if needed or bidding for additional resources. But it does seem to be one that, that that's recurring from various sectors that we meet saying that this is a, a, a substantial need. Yeah. If, if you look at um, Annex, one of the briefing paper, which outlines our service delivery model in terms of all the things that a person typically needs to maintain um, positive mental health and well-being. We have in place um, a, a five-year business case. The business case is for about 1,500 interventions per year across all of those areas. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know yet until um, survivors start to, to really use the services, but we think of about 1,500 interventions, that will be for about 300 to 500 survivors because some people will need more than, you know, for example, that's the whole point of it. It's a holistic package of care. So someone may need physiotherapy combined with a psychological therapy, and then a few months later, um, something else. So we have monitoring evaluation um, systems in place, and for psychological therapies, for example, um, it's called Cornet, where, where the individual is asked at the start um, a range of questions about how they're feeling and any issues and difficulties they, they may have. And then that's asked um, at interfering points, at, usually at each session, and then at the end of the session, so that you're able to say, was this intervention effective? And if it's not, then you start looking at others. So for example, we're talking therapy, doesn't work. Some people do find it still very difficult to verbalize um, the trauma. Then we look at alternatives around um, things like equine therapy, art therapy led by a therapist, and we just keep trying until we find the, the intervention that works for that person. So we focus on the outcome and whether it was effective or not for that individual, and if not, we, we try. So we will monitor that. That's a long term because there's 32 people currently in psychological therapies, but no one has completed yet their, their sessions. Um, and another interesting thing for the the committee is normally um, the number of sessions, average number of sessions would maybe be eight to 10 um, in VSS historically over the years. We're already seeing um, information come through from therapists that it looks like it's going to be a lot longer for survivors of HIA. And so again, we, we will report back things like that um, as, we, as we see them. And once we get to a position where we feel the business case is insufficient, we'll be flagging that at an early stage to the, to the department. And, and is that there if you want to, to, instead of it being eight to ten as normal, if it took fifteen to twenty, the flexibility is there to be able to respond in that way. It's a it's a needs based response where the focus is on the individual. So um, it's each individual will require different number of sessions and different interventions. Okay, Margaret, that's good. That's good to hear that and that, that flexibility is there. That's really important. So thank you for that. I'm going to pass over now to Doug Beatty, the, the vice chair, who is, uh, there he is. Yeah, Doug, we'll pass over to yourself. Sure. Th thank you very much. And, and Margaret and Oliver, thank you um, uh, as ever for your, for, your, for your evidence and answering questions. I mean, you are always a font of knowledge, which, which leaves me in, in awe. Um, can I just pick up on something that Colin, uh, Colin raised? And that is, uh, I mean, you're looking at roughly a circa of, of about 300 
um, survivors uh, that we're talking about here, but that could be up to 1,500 uh, interventions. One of the big issues that we're getting feedback from is that many of those survivors are being re-traumatized by going through the redress process. Uh, and therefore, there's a, there's a real chance that some of those people who you're dealing with now, once they go through the redress process, may be coming back to you over and over again because of, of that process in itself um, with, with psychological I issues. I mean, do, are you confident that you have the resilience for that, if that is the case? I mean, it's something we are trying to address in regards to the redress board, but just making sure you've got the resources, if, if that was to suddenly increase um, uh, over the coming sort of years, uh, have you got that resilience? We, well, in terms of how government and ALBs work, the business case that's signed off is for around 300 to 500 individuals, depending on how many, how many interventions they'll need. We've certainly got a commitment from the officials in the executive office that this is one of the key priorities. And as soon as um, we see a difficulty with um, needs and demands, that we, we flag that at the earliest stage. At the moment, we have 148 survivors who have came forward, um, around 69 of them. Um, we've been able to um, provide help and support directly through VSS, and then the other 79 are getting support through local um, and community organisations. So we, we um, monitor that weekly, and we uh, formally monitor it and really drill down into the detail on a monthly basis, and we share that with Fiona, the Commissioner, and with the Executive Office, because it's really important in terms of maintaining that trust with victims and survivors. We don't currently have a waiting list. It's really important that we don't start building waiting lists. Uh, and Mark, can I just ask, and uh, just on, on that, I mean, it, it seems to me that you are keeping statistics in regards to this. I mean, are you keeping statistics, for example, if you have an intervention with somebody and it's very positive, and then they go through the redress board and then they come back to you again because they've regressed in, in their in their treatment because of the redress process? Is that something you look at, or or is it not something that's really sort of coming to light at the minute? It isn't coming to light at the minute, but it should, because in terms of um, the roles and responsibilities and who's delivering services, um, we see ourselves with the redress board and the Commission as all delivering services. We're delivering health and wellbeing services, redresses, um, you know, delivering a redress service, and the Commissioner's Office is delivering service in terms of making sure policy is right, speaking to government and promoting the, the interests. So we, we see it very much that it should be one systemic and integrated pathway for survivors. I would say at the moment, we've all, we're all trying to get ourselves functioning. Um, but certainly what we would like to see over the next number of months is that whole clan pathway smoother and better um, amongst all three of us. And I think that includes, you know, we shouldn't assume that people go through redress and be re-traumatised and then need treatment. It would be more important to think about how we prevent that re-traumatisation happening in the first place so that they don't then need support and services from us. And that's the conversation I would like to start engaging in over the, the coming weeks and months. Uh, yeah, yes, and it's absolutely a conversation. It's just something I know the chair is very keen on as well. Just you know, making sure that redress is, uh, and we sort of aim off at the past any issues with that. Can I just ask one last question, please, then, uh, Margaret, and, and keep us straight on this? So I, I, maybe I should know this, but I'm not sure I do. Um, you are going to be going through the documenting or do, documenting experiences to, to assist people for going through the the redress board. Who owns? Who owns that process? Who who owns the the storing of that documentation and that information and that data? Um, who owns the risk? And what happens when you go through this documentation of experiences? If you suddenly come across something within that experience that you feel that, that there's there's a, a actionable criminal um, something criminal within it that you can actually take action against, is there processes in place for that? Yeah. So the recording of the lived experience has up until now. Um, being taken place within the interim advocate's office and then the commissioner's office. And I think when I met some of you um, one to one, we we I, did, I sort of flagged that that was something that we were looking at with Cossica in terms of where it should sit. So just in the last number of um, days and weeks, it's it's been determined by the commissioner that 
really the recording of lived experience should be part of an integrated health and wellbeing model and will um, sit and reside in the victims and survivor service in terms of our service delivery model. Um, in reality, what that will look like when an individual um, comes forward is probably the wealth or sorry the health and wellbeing caseworker um, will use that as the start of the client journey into health and wellbeing to exploring what has happened to, to, the, to that person, what the impact has been on them and then it's up to the survivor to choose what they do with that so the information belongs to them um, and it can be used either for some people want to put their story into so that it makes more sense for them um, it could be a tool in terms of sharing their story with their family or it could be used for the redress process and that's where we need to really find out what are the needs of the redress process versus the therapeutic needs of the individual to try and make that a therapeutic process rather than a re-traumatised process. Um, so in terms of who owns it, it's the individual survivor that will be carried out um, by VSS. And sorry, what was the second part of the, that's going out of my mind? Oh, yeah. oh, sorry, my yeah. disclosure. Yeah. Yeah. So the um, health and wellbeing case manager in VSS um, <laughs> is a, a health professional with their own registration accreditation, and she has in place very clear um, disclosure processes and procedures in place in terms of reporting to police authorities, others, yeah, if a Perfect. crime. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, next I'm going to bring Martina up into the spotlight and get some questions from her. So we'll pass over to yourself, Martina. Um, can I can I thank you, uh, particularly yourself, Margaret and Oliver, for, for all that you do? Um, it's something that I think you realise that um, in this committee and further afield, it's deeply appreciated. Margaret, I was a bit surprised, um, and I have said this before when I when I raised the when I seen the information on the business case about the the scale of the number of people that you would be providing the service for being three to five hundred, given that there have been thousands have actually gone through the historical institutional abuse now institutions as we call it, um, so. What you said about the officials telling you you need to red flag to them in advance, are you satisfied that in so doing that I know you said at the moment there's 148 engaging with you out of potentially maybe three or 500, but if that was to increase and the demand was to increase, uh, will it be fast tracked? Because we all know what it takes around business cases and around trying to draw down funding. So is there a process put in place that in the event of the demand increasing, that you will not find yourself with more demand than what you can supply in terms of a service? We, we did um, some stress testing, if you like, at the time, where we said for every 75 to 100 additional survivors who came forward, in the immediate term, we would need a caseworker for that. Um, and that principle has been agreed um, with the department and by the department. I think in terms of how fast they're going to turn it around. I know Gareth's um, up after us, and I'm sure he can give you assurance that he will be turning it around quickly and how critical and important it is that he does so. And I mentioned it earlier, if we start building um, waiting lists for survivors who have been waiting for years for these services, have built up courage to pick up the phone and call someone and contact someone, we have to be able to react quickly. Um, it wouldn't be good enough to be putting people on waiting lists. And it's critical that there is that fast turnaround and delivery and that we're ready if, if our capacity um, does need to be increased. And can I ask you then, see the interventions, you talked about 1,500 um, interventions perhaps a year, and I believe the funding that you have something in the region of 600,000. Mm -hmm. So is is that adequate funding for the scope of the service? Because it's very broad and, and the range of options available um, are fantastic. Like they're, they're very good. I was very impressed when I read the paper. But I was just wondering, does the funding match what you have, what the offering is you're supplying? It does. We've costed out, the, we costed out all each of those interventions. So, for example, 
Um, it's 500 social support interventions, 100 psychological therapies, 100 complementary therapies, um, and and so on. You know, each each um, service has its own. And then the costings we've taken from that have been the average costs based on our existing client base over the last five or six years. So I suppose there is a risk that the average cost is different for survivors of HIA. So that risk is there. But certainly in terms of a reasonable balanced approach, it seems that the 600,000 is sufficient for the 1,500 interventions. It's if we need to deliver more, then we'll need more. Okay, that's good to hear that. Uh, one last question, because uh, I know there's other members looking to get in here. Are there counsellors available who specialise uh, specialize in childhood um, sexual abuse? Um, as you know, I had been a junior minister who had been involved in the establishment of the historical institution abuse, so I'm acutely aware of what some of the needs would be. And when I was looking at what you were offering, I was wondering just is that part of what you provide? Yeah, so there are um, 27 therapists um, who are experienced in childhood um, abuse, sexual, emotional, physical and neglect. And eight of those have been specifically um, chosen to work with survivors of HIA because of their higher levels of experience and qualifications. And we would hope over the coming months that that eight will increase to 14. And again, based on current demand, that's sufficient, but, but let's keep watching and monitoring. Uh, again, Margaret, Oliver, thank you for everything that you do. And I could ask you a load of questions, but I know all our members are looking to get in. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thanks for that, Martin. I'm going to ask next for Pat to be brought up into the spotlight and we can get Pat to ask his questions. So over to yourself, Pat. Uh, thanks, Colin, and, and thanks to Margaret and Oliver. I don't think I've ever seen you looking so well, Oliver, with your shirt and tie on. First time I've ever seen you with a tie. <laughs> Especially for you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have uh, one question with uh, a few parts in it, and it relates to relationships with the redress board. And when Fiona Ryan was in with the committee a few weeks back, she suggested that a direct link should be established uh, between victims and survivors and the redress board. So, first of all, I'm just wondering, have you any information about whether that has been established or not? Second, uh, go ahead, sure, answer that one. I think I'd rather wait in your sub-questions before answer. I, I, I'm just wondering what the, the relationship is between your own organisation, Margaret, and, and the redress board as well. I think I alluded um, to it earlier that the, the three organisations um, providing and delivering services have very much focused on getting themselves up and operational. And now is the time we really need to work together to make sure there's one client journey, that there's not one, one process for redress, one for VSS and one for Cossica. So in direct response to the questions, there isn't really a direct relationship between VSS and redress at the moment, but we would be hopeful that there will be over the, the coming weeks. And sorry, Margaret, for interrupting you. Have you been asked by victims and survivors to intervene with the redress board on their behalf at any time? We, we Our health and wellbeing case manager um, does hear victims and survivors talking about their dissatisfaction with the redress board. Um, but I think we need to be really clear on roles and responsibilities. I know the Executive Office and COSICA are engaged with the Redress Board in terms of putting plans in place, in terms of um, improvements going forward. And I don't think it would be useful for VSS you know, to weigh in on top of that. But we're certainly part of the discussions with COSICA and the Executive Office on that. Okay, and do you, you don't know whether a direct line has been established between victims and survivors and the redress board? Are you saying that hasn't happened? I, I don't believe that has happened. Right. And, um, and, and I'd expect Gareth um, Johnson from the department would have more information on exactly what's happening. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's a question we're going to ask Gareth and, and probably one of the other questions I would want to ask him would be about conversations with the institutions between TEO officials and the institutions. But that's probably beyond your remit, uh, I presume. It is. Just, just, just one other question I wanted to ask you on in your briefing paper, you you mentioned information recovery. Could you expand on that a bit for us? Yeah, it's, I think it's going to be something that's going to be really um, complex and challenging. And again, like recording the lived experience, information recovery is set out under the legislation as being under the remit of COSICA, the Commissioner's Office. And again, it's been something that we've been talking to Fiona and her team on since she came into post in terms of should it be separate or should it be part of an integrated model. So just in the last number of weeks, um, we've agreed that any information retrieval and recovery that maybe has a large public interest will still reside with the Commissioner's Office. But day-to-day -day information retrieval, so for example, if a survivor is speaking to a case worker about their needs and they need a piece of information, then the health and wellbeing case worker would go and get that because it doesn't make sense to be constantly transferring survivors from one organisation um, to another. Where we see serious issues um, and themes and patterns emerging, so for example, um, missing information or destroyed information or um, information that should be available under law that is not or not forthcoming, then they're the types of big themes and patterns we would be reporting back to the commissioner. So day to day, we would be retrieving the information on behalf of the survivor, whatever they ask, and then any big issues we would be reporting back to the commissioner's office. So we will start that from the 1st of June. It's not yet in place, and we're still just working over the next few weeks in the finer detail of that um, with the with the commissioner's office. And, and have you encountered any difficulties to date in recovering some of that information? We haven't. VSS hasn't started it yet. We'll take it on from the 1st of June. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Thanks, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Pat. And Oliver, maybe whenever you're back up next, we'll see if Pat gets a tie on him as well for that. Maybe you'll be able to return that compliment to him there. Uh, I'm going to ask for uh, Trevor to come up into the spotlight now, and we can ask Trevor to, to start his questions. Trevor. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Margaret and Oliver, for your presentation. It's been very interesting. Uh, my questions really have been answered. I wanted to ask you about resourcing and uh, budget in particular. Because I, I would think that from next Monday you're going to have a, a, a bigger influx of applications for, for guidance and for treatment. Um, are you reasonably satisfied you can cope this year on a budget of £600,000? Yeah, I'm not sure I understand. That's a difficult question to say that you're satisfied. We're satisfied right now that we're coping. We're satisfied right now that there's no waiting lists. But there's a number of things um, that, that could increase that, but we would hope to be doing that in a very planned and considered way. So, for example, in building better relationships with the redress board and seeing what the client journey should be and how we can, how we and VSS can improve that, that then might generate um, more individuals being referred to us. And the second area is around the apology that the executive office are working on um, with the with the commissioner. And again, if there's um, communication, media, PR around an apology, we would also expect a significant increase in demand. But for both of those areas, we want to do it in a planned way. So we want to plan it out, look at what the increase in demand should be. And then we're very likely this year going to be going back to the executive office and asking for additional resources for that. Yeah, well, you, you just answered my second question, Margaret. Uh, you, do, you do have the facility, if necessary, to go back to the department for extra funding in year rather than having to try and regulate the flow of uh, clients that you might receive? Well, we've been given that assurance, right. and I think then that's something that you can interrogate the officials on after us. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thanks very much. That's, that's grand. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Trevor. I just want to check if um, George is with us, George Robinson, just to see if maybe George has any questions he would like to ask. Uh, we'll just uh, pop your wee mic on there for us, George. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, I, am, I am just joined very, very, very recently um, and uh, was given the, the wrong ID as well, so I couldn't get in from the very beginning, unfortunately. I have no questions. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Okay, George, not a problem. Well, look, um, Margaret and Oliver, that seems to be all of the questions at this stage. So can, can I thank both of you for your attendance with us today and giving us the update? It's been incredibly challenging times uh, with COVID and you're undertaking very sensitive and difficult work. Uh, but we certainly can um, take assurances that you're doing that um, to the best of your abilities in the times that we're in. I know that hopefully from next week, whenever there's a few more relaxations, that that will allow some some more of your face-to-face -face work to take place and I know that that will um, be welcomed by those in the sector and wish you and the staff team uh, the best for that. Um, just finally before I go, I'm going to bring Emma Sheeran in because I know sometimes Emma has a difficulty with the hand. I'm not going to say the hand gesture because that we could go anywhere with that one. But uh, I, I know, <laughs> I know that you um, sometimes have to be switched on there. So Emma, pass to yourself for a quick question. Thanks very much, Chair. Apologies, I was having issues trying to turn my mic and camera on there. Uh, no, I just thanks um, to, to both Oliver and Margaret for the, the presentation. And I know, obviously, we've had conversations about this before, and it's incredibly sensitive. I just wanted to know, because we're getting departmental officials in after this, and I know that the concerns around time and the length of time that it's taken to, for, for applications to make their way through for, for redress and all the issues that have been touched on around face-to-face -face services and the impact of COVID. At the beginning of the year, we obviously had the release of the reports north and south into the Magdalene Laundries um, sort of institutional abuse, human rights abuse, just call it what you will. I wondered if there has been um, communication to yourselves from victims of those institutions or if there is uh, thought around including victims that have, may now come forward as a result of the release of those reports and that sort of making the headlines um, and, and what you would say about that? Yeah, our current remit under HIA in terms of the support and services we've spoken about um, today are for those who were in children's homes um, between the years of 1922 and 1995 um, and currently doesn't include mother and baby institutions and Magdalene Laundries. Um, and we're also an arm's length body of the Executive Office. So both the HIA and Victims of the Troubles and Conflicts sit under the remit of the Executive Office. The Mother and Baby Institutions and the Magdalene Laundries sit um, with health at, at the moment. Um, and we have been engaged with health in terms of um, having in place some interim emotional support for those survivors who are going through the inquiry process at the moment. You know, we're health are leading that and asking survivors what they need and want from an inquiry. And that interim support um, is limited to two things. One, it's a listening ear if anyone needs to give us a call or um, send us an email. And secondly, then if someone does need access to a therapist, we will arrange that. Obviously, in terms of medium to longer term support, that's not sufficient. Um, it's nothing like what we've been talking about today. Um, I'm meeting health on Monday. They're aware of our service delivery model. I think it's really important that the survivors of mother and baby um, institutions and the Magdalene Laundries are involved in some sort of a, a, a co-design process around their own support and services. Um, I'd be wary about just saying, we can deliver these for you. So it's trying to balance um, the urgent need for support and services with I think we can do both. I think there's an urgent need, but I think over the coming weeks and months, we can also engage with those survivors and get their input into what those support and services um, should look like. But at the, mo at the moment, that's sitting um, with, with health, which complicates it a little bit, but it's not insurmountable. And we're really keen to be involved and share our um, experience in, in that. Um, area and and can I just finish with one point, Chair? If that's okay. 
um, because uh, earlier just reminded me in terms of the demands and just um, your question there reminded me around um, some of the gaps even within um, historical institutional abuse around the transgenerational impact. Um, and at the moment, we provide services directly to the survivor themselves, but thinking around um, carers and family members, and that has been raised in, as, a, as a potential um, gap. And then I know, um, and, and it could be similar um, here, around HIA survivors having paid for the funeral of other um, survivors. And whilst it's um, slightly outside of the remit of a health and wellbeing service, um, that's pretty difficult to hear from a survivor. And we, we really need to look and see if there's any way, um, any mechanisms that we can put in place collectively to make sure that that um, doesn't happen. Okay. Are you happy with that, Emma? Yeah, th thanks, Margaret. Uh, I suppose, I don't know if as a committee, if there's any scope for us to sort of reach out to the health committee or the health minister to, because I, I understand obviously the Magdalen Laundries is sitting under health, but with sort of cross departmental responsibility or commitment there. And obviously your, your organization has got, you know, people that are trained in dealing with people that have undergone trauma and dealing with with people in those sort of situations in a sensitive manner and it to, to me it would it would make sense to you know b maybe broaden that out i understand what you're saying around like commitments to, to to say that you could deal with all and the capacity and all of that and obviously the current redress scheme is is already under severe um pressure but just 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 thinking of, of a of a way that we could all work collaboratively to ensure that all victims are are getting um sort of the the service that they that they need and not ostracizing anyone people that have already been been ostracized by institutions so thank you very much margaret and um thanks chair okay, okay. Thank, thank you very much for that emma okay uh, margaret and oliver thank you very much then we we can conclude there thank you for your time today uh and we will uh, no doubt catch up with you again maybe before the end of the year but thank you very much indeed okay thank you very thank much. you, thank you. Okay, members, um, we have, we're a little slightly before ahead of time, but um, maybe we can think we could possibly park the, the, I mean, I think there was a reasonable suggestion there about the transgenerational impact on, um, on, on survivors. And that might be something that if we don't get that fleshed out during the next session, we maybe could write to somebody uh, be it the commissioner or, or otherwise uh, afterwards to sort of see if some work is being done uh, on that. Um, it might be a point. Is there any other issues that people see raised from that? Okay. Okay, that's grand, that's grand. Um, then I think we certainly have Alison and Gareth uh, present for the next section, which is the um, oral evidence session from the departmental officials. Maybe if we could bring Alison and Gareth up into the spotlight and check with them if they might be ready to go at this stage or if they might need a few minutes. Happy to happy to go, Chair, uh, and uh, Roberta is connected in uh, as well, Roberta Dalton. Okay, that's grand. Well, then, look, if we've got yourselves there, then what we can do, uh, Gareth, is pass over to yourself then to give us your uh, the evidence update, and then we can move into some questions and answers after that. Yeah, certainly. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to uh, just take members through the, the paper uh, and uh, perhaps add a little a little gloss to it. Um, in the, the paper that's been provided, we start by acknowledging um, why what we're talking about today is, is important. Um, what the Hart Report said about the experiences of victims and survivors, that the lasting effect that that has had on people, um, the role of publicly funded uh, compensation payments, but that that is really just uh, part of the response and, and part of the answer. Very important part, um, but there are wider uh, supports, wider 
wider reparation uh, measures that need to be in place, and uh, those are what we're talking about today. Uh, there was a specific recommendation in the Hart report about the provision of specialist services, uh, counselling services, practical help tailored to the individual needs of victims and survivors. Uh, as you will have heard, uh, the HIA support service launched on the 1st of December, uh, delivered through the Victims and Survivors Service, and I don't propose to uh, cover a, a lot of ground that colleagues from VSS have already covered, but the, the paper notes the range of services and uh, some of the latest numbers of people who have been accessing those. Uh, as the committee's been exploring, the uh, COVID restrictions did mean that the full range of services weren't immediately available, um, but that is growing. And, and the likes of complementary therapies, which uh, a number of victims and survivors have found very helpful, uh, are now starting to be available again. Um, that has been a, a very significant start for the service, uh, and I heard the committee rightly uh, paying tribute to uh, VSS for uh, the very quick work to get things up and running, uh, and uh, recalling too that the uh, the interim advocate was uh, very involved in the design. The uh, groups of victims and survivors themselves uh, contributed very much to the the co-design of uh, of those services, uh, and of course the uh, latterly. The, the commissioner uh, has been very much involved. Um, so it, it has been a very good uh, start, uh, but uh, there is certainly more that we can do and continue to develop. And the advice of the commissioner uh, in ensuring that services evolve to meet emerging needs uh, will be very important. There's been one of those uh, that's just been highlighted around uh, transgenerational uh, issues. Um, there are others too, and I can say more about those later if the committee would find it helpful. Uh, there's ongoing uh, liaison between VSS, the Commissioner and the Department. Um, so there is the, uh, the HIA support service. Um, alongside that, we also have a small grant scheme, uh, which is about providing social support uh, for victims and survivors of historical institutional abuse. Uh, it's open to uh, any group which is charitable status. Currently, two of the eight groups uh, access that small grant scheme, uh, mainly used for social events, for uh, going to training courses, uh, for uh, hardship grants where somebody's going through a period uh, of uh, significant hardship, uh, and for befriending visits addressing social isolation. Uh, that scheme's been in place since 2014. Uh, ministers have agreed to extending it for a further year, for the 21-22 year, uh, and during that time we will consult uh, the Commissioner uh, on uh, what the future of that scheme sh should be. We're conscious that the, uh, uh, the HIA support service is now in place, which is covering some of the areas that have been covered by the, the small grant scheme. We're encouraging groups to, uh, to go first of all to that service uh, and uh, then say we want to review during the year how we move forward with the small grant scheme, but it will certainly be in place uh, for this current year. Um, moving on just to the, the redress board and to the support that is uh, available to people who are making applications for uh, for redress. Uh, of course, the, the committee is familiar with the uh, legislative background to the establishment of the, the, the redress board um, and to the way it's made up where each panel that's considering an application consists of a judge uh, and two members with a health and social care background. That was very much a, a development uh, that was brought about uh, on foot of representation by the uh, political parties here to the Secretary of State. Uh, there is an automatic right of appeal uh, from a panel's assessment. Uh, we've set out some of the uh, most up-to-date uh, figures uh, for the, the redress board, uh, and in fact, I, I do have some that I can um, share later to the end of, of April when this paper was prepared. We had the, uh, at the end of March figures. Um, but 
had, uh, as you see, a significant number of applications which have been received, uh, those that have been considered by a, a panel, uh, and I think importantly to note determinations to the value of over £15 million uh, in the course of the, the last financial year. Uh, that, of course, has taken place against the, the backdrop uh, of the difficult operating uh, circumstances of the uh, pandemic. Uh, and uh, certainly, I would want to note uh, just uh, how much effort uh, the board between the, the president, the, the members, and, and its staff have put into to bringing those cases through. Um, we, we have highlighted in the paper, and I think this is something we may come to in, in later discussion, but one of the particular challenges for the board um, is that uh, it relies on other people uh, for information. Um, so, uh, first of all, you're making sure that you have a, a complete application. Uh, there are certain things which the legislation says need to be submitted with the application, um, like identity, you know, copies of identity documents, and, and, and so on. Um, and then the board needs to go to the institution concerned to request any records that they, they have. Um, so, when you add all of that up, uh, and again, I can say something more about this, there are a lot of applications before the board uh, that are uh, waiting for further information before they can be validated and go forward for uh, panel consideration. Um, you'll see there that uh, the board hasn't been um, uh, sitting on its hands about that. Uh, it has undertaken two exercises so far this year, uh, reviewing 444 applications that were incomplete or waiting for information. Um, that's resulted in uh, a number of requests going going out to solicitors and to third party organisations uh, to try and bring that information in uh, as soon as possible. Uh, the board's had 75 appeal notices, uh, 42 of those have been determined to date. Uh, Sir John Gillen, uh, a former Court of Appeal judge uh, who has been sitting to deal with those appeals uh, to help ensure that they're moved forward uh, as quickly as they, they can be once all the necessary information is, is submitted. Uh, and you'll see a little bit more information about that in the, the paper. Um, Applicants are entitled to free legal assistance uh, from a solicitor. That was a recommendation of the Hart Report. 95% of applicants uh, are taking that up. Another 5% prefer to, to do things themselves, and, and that's okay. But uh, it does illustrate how uh, solicitors are playing a critical and important role in the scheme. Um, I, I don't want to hold the committee back, and I'm conscious there will be questions. Uh, the paper does then just go on to set out the position on, on medical reports, uh, where, where it's an individual applicant, the board is assisting people to get those reports, uh, whereas through a solicitor, the solicitor arranges them and the board will uh, refund. Um, there's some information on the assistance that there is in uh, for people in preparing personal statements, recording their experiences. Uh, most often that's because they want then to, uh, to bring an application to the redress board, but it doesn't have to be. Um, that has been a, a service that has been uh, much welcomed by the victims and survivors groups. Uh, Theresa Toll in the commissioner's office has been uh, delivering it. It was uh, something that was set up by the, the interim advocate before. Um, and uh, that, that will be moving across to, to VSS to integrate, uh, as Margaret has said, with uh, the other services that are uh, being provided. But it has been something that people have felt uh, has been very valuable. We also recognise that there is a need for support uh, after an application to the board. We have an arrangement with Advice NI uh, for uh, financial advice for people who've received uh, perhaps a substantial amount of money, uh, and we are looking at the, with the Commissioner at how that could be further developed. Uh, finally, I, I did want to acknowledge, and no doubt we'll discuss it further, that as the committee has uh, observed, um, there have been 
concerns and continue to be concerns uh, that victims and survivors uh, have uh, expressed uh, about how the scheme is uh, organised at the moment and running at the moment. Um, I, a lot of that can come down to uh, communication uh, and of course we know that, that a lack of communication uh, can fuel anxiety. Uh, the president of the redress board, uh, Mr. Justice Huddleston, has met four of the victim survivors groups uh, at the end of, of March, uh, and I can I know that was a specific concern for the committee, and I can say more about that. Uh, and certainly, the board is not coming from the position of uh, thinking of self uh, itself perfect in all of this. None of us are. Um, uh, a year on uh, is, we believe, an appropriate time to, to work with the Commissioner and the Board uh, to look at all aspects of the applicant journey, not just those uh, in the control of the Board. Uh, we do want to see what is working well. We want to see where there's scope for improvement. We want to see where there is scope for further support. And necessarily, uh, all of that consideration and conversation would involve engagement with uh, victims and and, and survivors. So, um, in summary, uh, a significant amount that has happened uh, over the last year in delivering what victims and survivors we recognise have uh, pressed and fought for for, uh, for a long time. Um, we look forward to continuing to engage because there are certainly uh, further services and uh, uh, further supports and improvements that uh, can be made. Okay, Gareth, thank you very much for that um, substantial report. Um, I appreciate um, that it was, it was good to receive that report. Um, well, maybe just note, I know it's not your um, issue, but you mentioned that the report was prepared at the end of April, yet we received it last night in advance of the meeting today. So if it was prepared at the end of April, it would have been nice to have got it last week uh, to be tabled with the papers uh, and get the due consideration. Uh, but I certainly know from officials that come in front of us at the committee that it's never necessarily, you're certainly not clasping onto it, refusing to pass it over. So I appreciate that there are systems that, that you must follow. Um, in terms of the redress board, I mean, the, the, you know, the, there's no point in hiding away from this. The redress board is not functioning to a level that is acceptable by those within the victims and survivors sector. Um, I think it is much more than communication, to be perfectly honest, Gareth, because one thing that's been communicated to us by every sectoral group is that there's problems with the redress board. Uh, and I know that those groups have also articulated that to the commissioner. The commissioner has discussed that with us. Um, so there is quite a, a movement amongst committee, commissioner and sectoral groups that there are significant problems with the redress board. Um, so I think that we will need to, to maybe really just knock on the head that it's a communication issue because it's not. And, you know, there's concerns about the speed. Uh, people feel that they're looking at a redress board that's going to take for some people, at the current rate, 10 years before there's going to be conclusion, if you look at the numbers that are going through the system at the moment and then the number of people that need to go through it, um, there is significant concern about the impersonal nature of the redress board. Um, and that's because it's going through a very judicial process through a redress board that's part of the justice and court systems that's headed up by a judge and it's a president of a board and that's very traumatic for people that have had a very 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 difficult experience uh, a life-shattering experience and then find themselves in front of a panel having to justify um, their, their, their needs when they've already been through a process that's done that and then there are concerns about the disparity of awards uh, and we met with the, the groups that are telling us there could be somebody from Liverpool on the panel, there could be somebody from London on the panel, somebody from Belfast, and that separately these three people are assessing their claim. So we would be uh, of an opinion that the redress board needs a lot more of a, a more formalised process of a review after one year. Is that something that could be envisaged and that could be delivered? Um, 
in terms of uh, looking at the, the experience to date, and absolutely uh, I'm not shying away from the concerns that have been raised. Um, the uh, the victim survivors groups ring me as well um, as the, the commissioner, and, 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 and certainly I hear these uh, and would want to address them. Um, I think a year into the scheme is a good time to look at how all of the scheme operates, uh, and we have some thoughts on how we might do that, that we want to talk to the uh, victims and survivors groups and to the, the commissioner about. Um, I wouldn't want to uh, limit that to the, the board, um, because while the board provides a, a vitally important part of this. Um, it, it is not the only contributor uh, to the, the redress scheme. Um, for example, the commissioner has statutory responsibilities for publicising uh, the, the board, uh, and we're working with her on uh, how best we can uh, do that in an evidence-based way later in the year. Um, and the support that comes from the VSS service uh, is all part of this as well. And there may be more support that could be offered to people uh, at particular points of the, the client journey. Um, so what we would uh, like to do would be to look at the whole client journey uh, a year on. There may even be bits of, of the legislation, you know, bits of the rules uh, under which the uh, board operates that need to be looked at as part of that. So we would want to look at the, the whole client journey. Uh, and as I say, some thoughts on doing that, some thoughts on uh, how we could get some independent uh, input to that. Uh, and I would want to, to discuss those with the uh, with the victims and survivors groups. But but I think just it, it, it is important important to come back to say that uh, you know during the pandemic I, I, I sat in a meeting um, around about the 20th of March last year it, it, it was the morning before uh, Boris Johnston announced the the lockdown um, and a lot of very clever people said this can't be done. You can't launch a scheme of this magnitude in uh, in a pandemic. Um, Eleven days later, we did, uh, and the the board has, uh, as I did, delivered fifteen million pounds worth of uh, awards. Um, in terms of of speed, uh, and I know there was um, concern about a figure of, of 10 years and, and the commissioner uh, had, had raised that, I think kind of multiplying up uh, the number of cases in what has been a very unusual year. Uh, I mean, it was really six months into the year before cases really started uh, flowing through the system, uh, multiplying that up by, by figures in the, the business case. W what I would want to say is that as cases, uh, and, and I have been assured by the board, that as cases are, are coming forward and are ready to be listed, uh, they are being listed. Um, some of the uh, latest figures, um, 1387 applications, uh, which I think is the, the figure that you've seen, uh, 717 of those have been assessed by a panel. Uh, that leaves 670. But when you break down the 670, uh, 166 were incomplete, and so the board's gone back to the applicant to get some more information. Um, 158 uh, are uh, waiting for uh, information from the parties and others. So maybe a solicitor has said, we want to get a, a medical report and that's being waited for. Uh, and 109 that are waiting for information from institutions under Rule 9. Um, then there are, uh, there were 100, these were the end of April figures, there were 134 uh, that were due to be heard during May that were scheduled to be listed uh, during May. So in terms of what you might say was a backlog, um, there were only actually 94 cases that were waiting to be listed uh, and another nine that at the end of April that had been uh, 
received and we're just going through the, the clerical processes. Um, so I, I, I do want to set it in that context. Uh, equally, when victims and survivors are saying uh, we are not happy, um, obviously it behoves us to, to look at all of that. And as I say, I would like to do that in a, a joined up way across the whole of the client journey. Okay. Well, look, we'll 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 continue our conversations on that, Gareth. You you may want to do it that way. I think we may want you to focus more on redress and the redress board and the redress board process. But at this stage, we may just need to both draw our, our lines in the ground there and and continue with discussions to see how we can achieve what the sector are asking us for. I'm going to pass now to Doug Beatty as the vice chair. If we get Doug up into the spotlight, there, Doug, I'll pass to yourself. Thanks, Chair. Gareth, thank you for your very thorough answers, I have to say, and I don't have a great deal of questions for you, but just something that was raised a, a number of months ago, and I don't think we ever bottomed it out. When you talk about the grant scheme earlier on, did we ever bottom out any chance of getting a funeral fund for those um, who came to a position where they maybe passed away before um, they, they, they got a settlement from redress or indeed got a redress um, and then used and, and were of ill health and kept that money for, for, for a funeral. Did we ever bottom that out? Um, it has been something that has been discussed further over the, the last few months. Uh, Doug, and, and, and to, by the way, can I say congratulations on your uh, new appointment? Um, no, it, it has certainly been di discussed, and uh, let me explain the, the difficulty that we have within within TDO. Um, now, funeral costs were not part of the heart recommendations. That's not to say they're not an issue, but they weren't something that were raised by uh, Judge Hart. Um, clearly, victims and survivors have been advocating for the costs of funerals to be uh, funded. Um, funeral costs and funeral grants uh, are really first and foremost uh, something in the social security system uh, which would be a matter for the department for communities uh, and the uh, commissioner the interim advocate the commissioner certainly uh, had engaged with uh, with them um the, the, when you hear the stories um it is impossible not to be moved. Um, the people who have died in difficult circumstances, uh, people who have been uh, supported to a huge degree by members of the victims and survivors uh, groups as they came towards the uh, the end of their their lives, uh, and, and the desire to give people a, a, a decent burial. Uh, the issue for for us in the executive office is that if we were to set a precedent for one group, um, for this group of victims and survivors, and there may be lots of other groups of uh, needy people who could bring an argument for uh, uh, help, further help with, with funeral costs, um, we're setting a, a difficult precedent. And uh, so we have found it difficult to to find a way of, of moving forward on this. Uh, coming out of discussion with the Commissioner, one thing that we, we do want to look at and uh, I understand the Commissioner will be looking at is might there be some alternative source of funding or support? Uh, might there be a, a, a trust fund? I know there are trust funds that you know pay for, uh, if someone dies overseas, pay for the, the body to be repatriated. Um, you know, is there some trust fund that might be able to to access that would get us around some of these issues. Uh, and that's really the next line of uh, uh, inquiry. Uh, obviously, as more redress uh, awards go out and people have more resources, then uh, I, I would like to think it, that's a further help and it becomes uh, more of a, a, an issue. Um, but there are more inquiries, I think, to be, to be made about it. But I do want to be honest just about the difficulties that we've had. And I get them difficulties, Gareth, and I'm not going to I'm not going to labour it. I mean, I, I think I've you know just raised it, raised the, the the point, and I don't really care what it's called, whether it's called a trust fund or a funeral fund. Um, but you know, a a survivor who has recounted their story, who's going through a process, and who passes away penniless before that redress gets to 
uh, fruition in any shape or form. Uh, the, the, to me, there's a duty for us to make sure that they are buried properly and funding is made uh, available. Because see, if we don't, do you know who funds it? All of the other people who are in that group, um, they're, they're chipping in and they're funding this. And it's a small amount of money. We're not saying it's for everybody. We're talking about this very small amount of people who uh, either get a, a redress outcome and then they keep that money because they need to keep it for their own funeral or they, pa they pass away before they, they get through the process. But I mean, if you're going to look at it, I understand the difficulties. I'm not, I'm not, I'm just, I, and it's a, it, it might be seen as a trivial point in the great scheme of things. And I think we, I'm with Colin in the redress issue that we feel that that's here. Um, but it's just a small point that, that you know, if, if we could bottom it out, I'd be happy enough, you know, uh, and, and if we have to maybe take evidence on that from the, from the survivors, it might be worthwhile doing it also. But listen, thanks. Um, Gareth, you, you can come back if you wish, but but you don't have to. But thank you, and thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you for that, Doug. If I could bring uh, Pat up into the spotlight next, and um, we'll get a question from Pat. So it's over to yourself. Thanks, Colin, uh, and thanks for uh, your answer so far, Gareth. Gareth, I wanted to ask you about the discussions that he was holding with the institutions uh, and can you give us an update on what progress there has been thus far? Thank you. Yeah. Um, the, we have uh, long said, and uh, the Hart Report has acknowledged, that there is a responsibility on the institutions uh, who were found to have uh, had significant failings um, systemic failings uh, in all of this to contribute to the costs of the redress. Um, ministers met with uh, the two archbishops, with Archbishop Martin and Archbishop McDole, with representatives from Bernardo's and with the Association of Leaders of Missionaries and Religious of Ireland uh, on the 9th of February uh, to discuss this and, and to discuss more widely uh, the remaining heart uh, recommendations, uh, including the apology and memorial. Um, it was a, a, a broad-based agenda. Um, we talked to them about the progress that there'd been on redress payments and the amounts that were being paid out. Uh, we talked about the uh, provision of services to victims and survivors. Uh, we talked talked about the apology and the role that the institutions would, would play in that. Um, and we talked about uh, the principles that needed to inform the talks that we would have on contributions from the institutions. Um, those principles would include uh, an open book approach on the part of the institutions. Um, they would include things that uh, Judge Hart recognised were, were fair, like you shouldn't have to pay twice for the, the same case, uh, fair enough. Um, they uh, included a lot of focus on, on fairness and transparency as we moved forward. Uh, and the, a positive thing which came out of that engagement um, was that uh, everyone agreed that acceptance of responsibility and recognition of the harm done were central to the way forward. Um, the next step on this will be that we will have a uh, round table meeting, which uh, ministers will be facilitating uh, with the institutions themselves. That first meeting was uh, kind of at a, at a higher level with the archbishops and uh, Amri, uh, but with the institutions themselves. Um, there was a suggestion uh, that uh, it might be profitable to have a, an independent facilitator for these uh, talks and uh, that is something that, that uh, we've been thinking about ministers are, are, are will be considering um, but uh, no we need to, to move quickly to this this next stage and that will be a round table uh, after that then we'll break up into individual uh, talks with each of the institutions uh, just one thing I, I, I would say and and not 
this doesn't uh, take away from the possibility of uh, or the desirability of you know early payments or payments on account or uh, you are starting to uh, see the institution stepping up to the the mark in financial terms um, but we are conscious that in the south uh, they agreed all of this with the institutions at the start of the process uh, and then found that the redress cost many times more uh, than uh, was originally anticipated and uh, had to go back a, a second time, which, which really hasn't been terribly satisfactory. So I, I think there is something about keeping the talks open uh, until we have some certain about what the total cost of this scheme is going to be, but that doesn't mean not starting them soon, uh, nor does it mean uh, not uh, looking at all the possibilities for some money to start flowing in. Okay, uh, and has, um, I'm, I'm going to steal uh, Trevor Lund's usual question when this issue is raised. Has it ever been established whether or not the institutions had uh, insurance cover? Uh, that is something that we will be uh, exploring again uh, when we meet in the, the round table and it's very much on the, the agenda for that. I know the committee took a significant interest. Um, I, I had, in earlier discussions uh, where I had asked the question, I'd been told no, um, but we will want to make absolutely sure that uh, that is the answer. We'll want to make absolutely sure uh, that there isn't some insurance we could be calling on. And I know that uh, uh, this is, is, is Trevor's background. Um, so the, the message has been well received on that. Okay, thanks for that. And um just in terms of a timeline for these conversations, stroke negotiations, do you have a timeline for when they might be concluded? Uh, as I say, in terms of concluding, uh, no, because th there is something about keeping open until we're clearer um, on the flow of applications. Uh, and you know, There hasn't been a big publicity campaign yet, and that's something we, we might want to talk about separately. Um, but in terms of next steps, uh, an early roundtable uh, and then into the one-to-one -one, uh, negotiations with the uh, uh, with the institutions, potentially with the appointment of a facilitator um, to, to, to work with us and, you know, I mean, frankly, to challenge both sides uh, in all of this as we go through. Okay, thanks for that. And just, Chair, if you'll indulge me, one other question on, on another issue. Um, when the, the Commissioner was in with us some weeks ago, Fiona Rahn, she indicated that she that there should be a direct line between victims and survivors and the, the redress board. Uh, do you know if any work has commenced on establishing that, uh, that link? Thanks. Uh, yes, um, and uh, absolutely there should be that, uh, that direct link in. Um, it, it, before the redress board became operational, uh, the, the staff that had been assigned to it um, held uh, engagement events with the victims and survivors groups. Uh, now, uh, you know, a year on, of course, in the light of experience, there are new points to be made and, 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 and that's fine. Um, but uh, there was engagement with the board that started at that stage. Uh, and I know that one of the early things that Mr. Justice Colton, as the previous president, did was to meet with the, the victims and survivors groups. Um, the new president uh, has met with uh, the groups, Mr. Justice Huddleston has met with the groups, four of the groups uh, who wanted to meet on the 31st of, of March. Uh, I am assured by the board that uh, it has has responded to any request from the victims and survivors groups to have a meeting. I understand from the uh, commissioner that there, there's a couple of groups would, would like to meet again in the near future. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that direct link with the, the groups has been established. I'm, I'm not even uh, so sure it's a matter of uh, the board meeting the groups. I know that uh, uh, victims themselves have been dissatisfied at the information they've been receiving from the board uh, about where their case actually sits and, and issues like that. And they're dependent on their legal representatives communicating with the board. Uh, and 
there, there may be difficulties, and I'm not in any way criticizing the, the solicitors for the victims, but I mean, they obviously have other workloads as well. So I suppose, uh, you know, you're almost talking about a helpline that victims can, can phone where they can get information directly from the board. And, and I stand corrected on that, Chair, if, if, if uh, I have picked Fiona Ryan up wrong, but uh, I was assuming it was some sort of uh, line like that where victims could get information from the board. Do you want to come in on that, Colin? Yeah. I, I would need to go back and check that myself, Pat, but, um, you know, if Gareth has any clarity on that, it would be appreciated. Uh, and maybe just I, I've picked the question up uh, wrongly, uh, and certainly that is uh, something that we've we've heard from from victims and survivors. Now, uh, as I said at the uh, start, um, solicitors have got a very important role to play in all of this. Um, and when uh, somebody comes in through a, a solicitor, the solicitor is the representative. Uh, and the normal way of working is that uh, communication is through the solicitor. Um, uh, there's a smaller number of people who make direct uh, applications and the board will then uh, be in touch with them directly about their application and, and keep them up to, to date. Um, now, uh, you know, this has been a difficult year um, for solicitors' practices and, and, and for everybody else. Um, I think this is certainly one of the things that we want to look at uh, in the course of, of what I'm talking about, the, this examination of how things are working uh, a year on. Um, it is a point that we, we've heard from victims and survivors. Um, and it's... it's what options might there be um, that, uh, you know, on the one hand, respect the, the role of solicitors, which is important, but uh, on the other hand, I mean, the, yeah, that, there is a reality that um, victims and survivors, um, sometimes, uh, what I've heard is sometimes people just are not quite sure what way to turn, don't know what way to turn, and that's not a, uh, that's not a good thing. Okay, um, so, Sorry for cutting across you. Yeah. I, I, I'm just wondering if it would be out of order uh, of me to suggest that officials make contact with the commissioner uh, and, and try to establish exactly what it is that victims need uh, because she was talking about a direct line into the, the redress board and, and, and if something could be organised along those lines. Thanks. Right. No, I say that, that that point is familiar just when you were talking about a direct line. I think I was, I was thinking about something else. No. Uh, Part of what I'm, part of what we're thinking for uh, the way forward is uh, you know, bringing together board, commissioner, ourselves, VSS, looking at each stage of the client journey, looking at what the issues are, and, and looking at what can be done. And communications would be a, a, a key bit of that. So, uh, no, looking at that is, is uh, certainly on the agenda. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, if we could bring Martina up into the spotlight next, please. Martina. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Gareth. And obviously, language is important um, because a lot of the victims and survivors are listening in here today. And there's an urgent need for the Historical Institution Abuse Redress Board to operate within a trauma-informed perspective. You know, the information I've received, and maybe you could correct me, if I'm wrong, if it's not the reality, that awards are being made based on how much detail is included in applications. Because, Gareth, if that is the case, then that fails to consider the effect that trauma can have on memory. And some victims and survivors we know block it out and are simply reluctant to go back to the place to remember the abuse. Indeed, we also know for many of them recounting these experiences can be re-traumatizing. So the redress board needs to operate within a trauma-informed framework. And if they are not doing that, can we get the redress board to operate within such a framework? And what is your understanding of the application and how the awards are made? Um, well, if there are uh, particular points around how the, the board should 
uh, and could be uh, more responsive to the, the trauma that people have experienced, I'm sure uh, they would be uh, content to, to, to hear those and to consider them. But uh, in terms of, uh, of awards, um, uh, as I said earlier, each of the panels that's considering an award uh, consists of a judge and two people with a health and social care background. And this was something, I mean, if you go back to the Hart report, it was just the judge. Uh, this was something that uh, survivors groups lobbied for, uh, the political parties uh, took up, uh, and it was agreed by the, the Secretary of State in the uh, hiatus with the executive. Um, I was myself involved in uh, interviewing uh, those people who were appointed. Um, and I have to say, was impressed by um, their understanding of, of, of childhood trauma. I mean, they, they were all people who were uh, coming from backgrounds where they had uh, dealt with uh, children's services, with um, children experiencing trauma, um, you know, aware of the effects that that could have th throughout life. So uh, I, I think the fact that there are those members there is is important. Um, in terms of awards and the other one, yeah. Can I just ask you, Chair, just to, I'm sorry for putting a call to you, but I just want to pick up on that point. So just for clarity and to avoid doubt, are you telling me that then it's not based on an application of what's written in an application, that that's not what the award is based upon, that a count is taken uh, given the experience of those who are carrying out uh, the assessment of these applications, that they are bringing with them that informed, that trauma-informed perspective to the assessment of those applications? Yeah. Well, um, the, the ultimately the board um, uh, you know, has to work with the information that's that's in front of it, and we would encourage people to put as much information as as they can before the board. Um, but there are certainly uh, plenty of cases where the board has has gone back and has asked for further information, uh, or has asked for a particular kind of report or medical report, um, maybe a, a report from a, a specialist in, in mental health. Um, I, with a view of um, operating to the principle of, of trying to do what is, is fair for victims and survivors, uh, there was, I'm, I'm conscious, just previously, there was a concern raised about uh, disparity of awards. Uh, the board does publish uh, the uh, guidance on the, the levels of award, um, and that's published on the, the website. Now, it, it is in bands because you know, within bands, uh, all the individual uh, aspects need to be taken into account. Um, I know that the uh, members of the, the board and, and staff um, have also had uh, training about trauma, specific training about trauma uh, and the impact that that, that can have. Um, now, I, I mean, if there is uh, some detail or evidence that isn't in an application and there is no hint uh, that that's something that the board should be pursuing. Uh, you know, that's going to be very difficult. Um, and something that maybe we can do in those cases is the service that's available now in VSS that, that has been with the, the commissioner um, about helping people, not in any kind of legal situation, but in a supportive situation, uh, helping people get their experience down on paper and they then have something that they can they, they can take to a, a solicitor so um, I, I could say uh, absolutely there is an awareness of trauma informed practice um, though you know ultimately the board is going to need something to go on in making a decision of course that is the case but gareth we as members of this committee individually and collectively are hearing from victims and survivors about being traumatized re-traumatized by their experience of their engagement with the redress board so uh, we all want to get this right and uh, we all want to take care of those victims and survivors god knows they went through enough 
and we none of us want to hear about them re, being re-traumatized. So I think it's important that in what has been said earlier, that the redress board, the officials, VSS, but particularly listening and hearing to the needs of victims and survivors so that we can get this right. Because in my assessment of what I've been hearing for the last year, we haven't done that yet. This has not been done to service the needs of victims and survivors, this being the redress board. So we need to acknowledge what we're hearing and we need to put in place practices and procedures that is going to better protect the victims and survivors. And we cannot have a system in place that results in them being re-traumatized. And I think if there's a takeaway from this meeting today, it's a collective understanding from everyone, I believe, in our committee. It's a concern that we have about victims and survivors being re-traumatized by their engagement with the redress board. That must stop. Um, victims and survivors are absolutely at the, the centre of all of, of this. Um, when you start to recall uh, experiences that um, you had in the past, trauma that you suffered, experienced in the past, um, I, I mean, that can of itself be re-traumatizing. Um, but uh, anything that we can do to, to minimize that, uh, and I mean, I, I, I firmly believe that the uh, board and the, the president, uh, just uh, like the commissioner and all of us, I mean, that, that ultimately, is, we don't want to see uh, victims and survivors uh, re-traumatized if, if we can help it. Uh, I should add that uh, the uh, redress board had asked me for uh, contact details for the, the committee. Um, so I understand that they would be, uh, the, the president wants to, to reach out uh, in the, the very near future to the, the committee uh, and see if there's something that could be done directly, whether it was uh, a meeting or whether it was you know, perhaps inviting the, the chair, the deputy chair uh, to, to, to meet uh, some members of the, the wider board. So uh, I know he is looking to, to, to reach out um, so that he alongside uh, so that he and the, and the board um, can hear more about and can address those those concerns. Well, unless he's deaf and they are deaf, I'm sure they've heard all of us in the committee raise our concerns, but it'll be up to the chair and the vice chair and the committee to see how that should be taken forward. Can I just have one other question, please, chair? And it's to ask uh, the department what you're doing to ensure that the victims and survivors who live in Britain uh, no longer have their benefits cut due to these awards. And I know this is not within your remit, but I'm asking if there's representation being made on their behalf. Yes, uh, very much so. And uh, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have lobbied on this uh, at ministerial level. Um, I'm pleased to say that our latest discussions with the Department of Work and Pensions have been uh, very positive. Uh, we're now working with them uh, jointly to prepare uh, the business case which needs to go to Treasury on this. Uh, once that is done, uh, then they will be able to change their regulations um, but in the meantime we'll be able to apply an administrative disregard so uh, we, we're certainly making good progress on that uh, and I would like to think that we would have uh, positive news to share with victims and survivors uh, very soon. Okay, Martina, happy enough. Um, yeah, um, look, but before bringing um, Trevor Long in, uh, Something just I want maybe just to, to, to iron out something there, Gareth, that you've said that you know that the political parties and the, the sectoral groups, representative groups, you know, that they were happy with the, 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 the judge and and then the other healthcare professionals that were on those panels. Now my recollection may not be entirely goes back the full length of this. I was sort of late to the, the party just being involved in some of the negotiations about two years, three years ago in this. But as I understand it, the, the concern and the problem that the political parties had was that there was too heavy an influence of the judicial um, world in these panels. And in fact, the problem that we're having now, even with that judicial influence being watered down, the concern and the problem seems to be 
about the judicial influence and oversight that there is for that. So again, I think there's a pattern that is emerging there that the political parties and the representative groups were unhappy with the uh, maybe overbearing influence of a judicial process in this. There has been a softening of that, but that still is of concern. And I think you're right, it does come in communication and sometimes the way things are communicated the fact that you know the, the the president and the board needs to get contact details for us you know we're in that big white house so way up at the top of a hill i don't think there's many people that really struggle to find out where we are but if that's a struggle for somebody to have to go and find out where the contact information is for us it just shows how we can all exist in our own little bubbles but i want to bring trevor in now for um if he would like to come in and ask some questions there yeah, uh, thanks, Chair, and uh, thank you, Gareth, for your report so far, and thanks to Pat Sheehan for asking my question. Um, the, the, um, just, just to pursue the question of, of contribution and who actually pays here, I think it's, let me be clear, but it's, it's absolutely right, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, the Redress Board is taking this on, and I'm glad to see the progress that you're, you're making. It, it may not be perfect, but uh, nothing very seldom is. So we, we look forward to the rest of the scheme. It's going to go on for a very long number of years, I think. But on the question of liability, and here I go back to insurance again, they, they, you seem to have had some some fairly civilised discussions with particularly the two churches and Bernardo's, and they, they appear to have uh, accepted some responsibility in this area. But... but I can't help thinking you're, we're not pursuing this quite as vigorously as we, we perhaps should, because if this if this was a, a, a normal situation, let's say, put it that way, uh, and the, the redress board is paying out money, it, it would have a right of recovery against the institutions who actually bore the liability for what happened. And uh, whether or not they have insurance, in a way it's academic, uh, they, they have liability. They have responsibility. So can, can you expand a wee bit further, perhaps, on the amount of discussion, the amount of pressure, the amount of investigation that's going on to, to get them to accept that they have a liability here, a major liability? Because if this, if this process that we're involved in didn't exist, they would be getting sued every day now by, by victims. Of course they would. And who knows what awards they might, they might get. So as I said, it's good that the government is taking it on, but I think we need to look to the public purse as well to see what recoveries can be made. Um, ministers and, and officials both have been absolutely clear with the institutions, uh, and that goes back to discussions that were being had with them even before I came into this job, um, that there is a responsibility, uh, moral and otherwise, uh, to, to make contributions and to bear some of the cost. It should not all fall on the, the public purse. Um, so th that is absolutely the basis where, where we're working from and has long been uh, emphasized. Um, and uh, uh, while it is uh, good to have a working relationship um, with the uh, institutions and, and, and we've managed to, to maintain that, um, I mean, the devil will be in the detail of this. Uh, it has been important and significant that the institutions uh, have uh, committed uh, and have acknowledged that they have a role to play. Um, but it's when we get down to pounds, shillings and pence, um, that, 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 you know, uh, I think that's when, when the difficulties are, are, are going to come. Uh, in terms of any legal positions, uh, we uh, will have a, a lawyer and, and uh, I'm expecting there will be a, a QC there as well, um, who will be supporting us as a department uh, as we go through this. So we're um, very alive to the legal aspects. Um, and we're also um, looking at what uh, financial input, um, accounting input, uh, and so on that we might need um, so that we're up to speed on, on the financial issues. Um, I mean, we, we absolutely intend to 
um, press this. Now, th there are uh, justifiable points that the uh, institutions will make about uh, the services that they've already provided, the cases that they've already paid out on. Okay, uh, I would take account of those. And, and Judge Hart said it would be important to, to do that. Um, but uh, no, this is, is it is something we're absolutely committed to. The priority has been to get the redress scheme in, to get the sports services in, to get the commissioner in, focused on victims and survivors. Um, but uh, you know, really, the, the next priority is now uh, the other side of the equation, which is the institutions. Um, just more generally, and 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 uh, chair, going back to to what you said, um, I, each member of the uh, panel has got has got one vote um, that is in the legislation. Um, and we've seen the involvement of the non-judicial members, uh, not just at panel level, um, but the, the redress board has got a, a management board uh, that sits regularly that works on policies and uh, procedures and uh, governance and so on. Um, and the uh, non-judicial members are also represented on, on that board. So there has been an effort to uh, involve them at, at all levels of decision making. Chair, just before I go, um, I'm sorry to, to belabor the point, Gareth. I don't, didn't disagree with anything you said in response to my question. That's fair enough. but. Uh, in, in terms of insurance, there's, there's a golden rule about liability insurance. The customer doesn't admit liability and they don't admit that they have insurance. That, that's standard practice. It's in the policy. You, don't, you just don't do those things. Uh, so I think you know, the point at which you will find out if these institutions have some insurance cover available is when you ask them for the money. You'll either get a response from them or you'll get a response from whatever insurance company is involved. Yeah. But I'll leave it at that. It's, uh, as I think the work you're doing is great. Uh, thank you, uh, Trevor. And uh, that will be one of the, the questions that I will be asking Council as we start on this uh, about insurance. It's uh, uh, It's been helpful to have your input on that, and we will certainly raise it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. For that. Can I ask maybe for George and Emma to be brought up into the spotlight and we'll just do a little check uh, on final points or questions. George, would you have anything there you want to? Yes, yes, Chair. <clears throat> three, or four, three or four questions here for Gareth and thank Gareth for his, for his presentation. Um, the first, first question I have is how many, st many staff, full-time or part-time, um, is... Um, uh, taken on this mammoth, mammoth, mammoth task, and, and very worthwhile task as well. And may I say, and wh where about where are they housed? And uh, Gareth keeps referring to the institu institutions. Um, could I ask? Maybe I shouldn't be asking, but who are the in institutions? And have um, have we reached uh, or what might be the, the estimated full cost? For the, the you know the full the full compensation uh, situation, uh, maybe, maybe that's an unfair question to ask. But I'll, I'll ask it anyway. I don't mean any disrespect. It's good to see that these people, at long long last, the, the victims and survivors <clears throat> have been compensated. And I'm totally in, in complete support of it. Thanks, Chair. Uh, happy to uh, ask those. Uh, to answer those questions, Chair, um, in terms of staff, uh, there are 34 staff in the uh, the redress board who are working on this. Uh, we will certainly keep that uh, complement under review. In fact, uh, over the last few months, I approved um, a couple of additional legal staff uh, to support getting cases ready for um, uh, panels, um, and there was a there was another member of staff that that I do or another staffing change that I'd agreed. So uh, that's certainly something we keep under review, but 34 staff, they are based in the headline building uh, at the, on 
to the Corporation Street, top of Waring Street uh, there in Belfast, so uh, a fairly central location, um, but uh, have been doing a great deal of their work uh, virtually uh, in the same way as the, the committee, uh, and that's been a necessity over the, the last while. Um, in terms of the full costs, um, the business case uh, that we uh, put together on this, I have to say, I mean, not having huge amounts of information because uh, there was never any definitive list of uh, people who were uh, residing in the, in the homes run by the institutions. Um, the business case had a, a range of estimates uh, for total cost, which ranged from about 140 million um, through a central estimate uh, up into the 400s of millions, um, up to an upper estimate above uh, 600 million. Um, and uh, I think we, well, one of the things that will need to be considered with the commissioner is uh, publicity, because we recognise that uh, while the, the number of applications received has been substantial, uh, compared with the numbers of uh, young people who went through these homes, maybe particularly the homes that came in for uh, special criticism from, from Hart, uh, were much greater, and uh, we want to see how we can we can bring those applications in. Um, mm -hmm. And I can certainly give you the, the names of the institutions. These are the six that uh, Hart found to have had systemic failings. Uh, that's De La Salle, uh, the Sisters of Nazareth, Bernardo's, the Sisters of St. Louis, the Irish Church Missions, and the Good Shepherd Sisters. Thank you very much, Gareth. Thank you. Okay, Emma, do you want to come in there? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, a lot of what I had, sort of the, the, the queries or questions that I had have been covered in the debate, and I would echo the remarks of others around the importance for communication with victims and survivors around redress, particularly, and obviously the concerns have been raised by others. Um, I know that in a previous presentation, we had, I had raised the, the sort of concern around members or uh, victims that are no longer resident of the North and how this can negatively impact on benefits that they're receiving if they if they do receive redress, that that can, it can be means tested and impact on, on housing benefit or other things that they might be getting. So um, if there was an update on that specific point, um, and that, that's it for myself. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, in terms of uh, Great Britain and victim survivors who are living there, uh, as I noted earlier, we've been having uh, talks with the Department of Work and Pensions, and, and those have been positive, and, and we're moving forward on that. Um, in terms of, of people living in other jurisdictions, there's not really anything we can do because we don't have the uh, the levers to, to pull, um, and uh, benefit systems, uh, tax systems, uh, may, may vary. Uh, I know in a number of jurisdictions, uh, compensation is disregarded, certainly for tax purposes, uh, and there will be some sort of disregard um, for uh, benefits purposes. But uh, unfortunately, that's where um, it, it, it would need to be representations that were being made to the uh, uh, to the governments there uh, in terms of how these payments were were, were treated. Okay, that's great. I think Martina Anderson would have just a quick question that she wants to ask. Um, so if we can bring Martina back in again. Yeah, and it's it's a follow up with just what you and what you responded to Emma there, and um, because of what you also had said to me earlier in, in relation to those survivors in Britain. So can I ask you, is there an administrative disregard in place now? as a safety net for, for survivors uh, in Britain to offer them some kind of protection for loss of pending, um, for, for loss of, of, of finances that they may get um, pending some kind of legislative change? Because I thought what you said to Emma might have been a little bit different to my understanding. 
Yes. No, uh, it's not an administrative disregard as such, but what the Department of Work and Pensions has done is that any cases that have come to their attention, uh, they have parked. So they haven't uh, tried to recover anything. They've held them until the, the policy issue is uh, set out. And I understand there have been a couple of cases falling into that category. Okay, so we may need to get an update on that, Chair, uh, pending any legislative changes or the representation that the Joint First Ministers are making, uh, hopefully, to, to iron that out. But that's important for, for those survivors who, who are living in Britain. Okay, thanks for that, Martina. I, I'm just going to finally check uh, Trevor Clark, just in case um, we're not getting your um, the, the raised hand there. Just if you have anything that you wanted to ask. No, I'm, I'm fine there, Chair. You're okay. Perfect. That's grand. Thank you very much. Look, um, Gareth, thank you very much to you and your colleagues today. We appreciate this is a very complex issue. It's been long running. Um, obviously, once it's up and running, there will be identified uh, areas that we can improve on. So uh, I'm glad that we're all able to, to articulate them to each other and hopefully progress with them to find some, uh, some changes to, to help everything going forward. But thank you for your attendance here today. Thank you, Chair. Okay. So we'll just do a jig round then if we bring members up into the spotlight and we can... Is there any issues that anybody wants to raise on the back of that? We get some uh, confirmation on matters there, but certainly we had discussed the possibility of a committee motion about... Um, developing a, a request for a specific uh, review of the redress process. Is that still something that members think is relevant and that we should progress with? Yes, Chair, I agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We could do that. And Ch Chair, I think the, the point that was made about the uh, redress board it to come in front of all the committee. Um, yeah. If that was an opportunity, I know they, they talked about perhaps meeting the chair and the vice chair, but I do think we need to try to get a number of people around the table um, mm -hmm. together, collaborating, whether it's both officials, the redress board, feet, SS and, and the victims and survivors, as opposed to those maybe just advocating for them. We need to, they need to be in the room to co-design this process because there's a problem with the redress board and it doesn't seem to be getting addressed other than being called out and we need to do more than that. Yeah, actually, and what I, I think is actually really highlights the, the, the purpose and role of this committee is that we actually as a committee are the only ones that have probably met each and every sector right the way through and actually had a question and answer session. So we, from our view, can see that there are issues that maybe others aren't aware of. So um, I think us being able to progress, that would be very, very useful. Okay, members, thank you for that. That was uh, a, it was a long session there because we started early, but uh, it's appreciated that we've got through that. If members are happy, we can move on then to the next item. Uh, we're going to move on then to item seven, which is the SR 2021-114, the Department's Transfer of Functions Order, Northern Ireland 2021. If I can refer members to pages 49 to 63 of the meeting pack for the relevant papers that are there, uh, and also uh, refer you to the tabled pack for the report from the examiner of statutory rules, which find no issues with this rule. Now, the Committee for Justice and the Committee for Infrastructure have both responded to inform the committee that they are content with the statutory rule as well. And the committee considered the SL1 on the 21st of October and was content that a statutory rule be made. There have been no changes since the SL1 was submitted. So therefore, can I seek agreement that the committee for the executive office has considered SR 2021 forward slash 114, the department's transfer functions order Northern Ireland 2021 and recommends that it be affirmed in the assembly. Martina? Um, uh, not wanting to do anything at all to um, to stop this passage. Uh, we need to get accelerated passage. But, Chair, I do think there is an issue as to, and I've been saying this all year um, since I've been in MLA, as to how we ended up with staff in one department and the authority in another department. 
And we, and this is where this has been now required, this legislative process to change that. It should never have happened. Yeah. And it's okay people saying we are where we are. I, this is not to stop this journey, but I do believe we need an explanation as to how we ended up with the authority and responsibility in one department and the staff sitting in another department without that uh, responsibility. Okay, well, we'll certainly write and ask for that, um, Martina, and that, uh, that won't you know, prevent this from progressing, which is think, what we need, but we can certainly write and ask for that, that explanation. Can I just um, check then that there's nobody that disagrees with that um, SR, that we're all happy with it? Great. Okay. And that we will ask for the uh, mm -hmm. and the how background as to how we got to the situation and where we were. Okay, members, item eight is SR 2021-113, the Public Services Ombudsman Act, Northern Ireland 2016 Commencement Order, Northern Ireland 2021. Pages 65 to 127 of the meeting pack are the relevant papers. Now, there was no statutory requirement to lay the rule, but it is being laid as a matter of good practice in order to ensure the transparency and accessibility that uh, would be good and proper in um, progressing these. So could I get agreement that the Committee for the Executive Office has considered SR 2021-113, the Public Services Ombudsman Act yeah. 2016 Commencement Order, Northern Ireland 2021, and is content with the rule? Okay, I think people are happy enough with that. The next statement is for uh, our committee to engage with the Ombudsman on a statement of principles on the handling handling of complaints to help us progress that to the next stage. So thank you, members, for that. Item 9 is the Forward Work Programme, which is on page 129 of the meeting pack. Um, just a few juggle around um, dates. Uh, it was proposed, or we're certainly proposing to move the briefing on June monitoring to the 9th of June in view of a delay in the monitoring process. That should allow us to take a briefing from departmental officials on the urban villages and communities in transition program. And we've scheduled that in on the 2nd of June uh, in place of the June monitoring. Um, would members be happy enough with that? I know we discussed that last week. Um, we also agreed to seek papers from stakeholders in advance of the concurrent meeting uh, with the Department for Finance, which is scheduled for the 16th of June. So can I get agreement that we maybe would go to the stakeholders from the High Street Task Force session on the 3rd of March and write to the Committee for the Economy and Finance for a list of stakeholders from whom they wish to request papers. Members be happy enough to get that information. Okay. And if we could schedule a stakeholder session with groups representing victims of historical institutional abuse, if we could schedule that for the 23rd of June with a view to informing a committee motion which would be about the review of the redress board. And I and work with the, the business committee to try and schedule those that they, they fall in order. Would members be agreeable with that? Okay, thank you very much. That allows us to move on to item 10, which is correspondence. There are seven items of correspondence on pages 135 to 161. On page 10.6, um, at page 158, there is correspondence from the House of Lords European Affairs Subcommittee on the Protocol um, on Ireland, Northern Ireland, requesting engagement with the committee for the Executive Office. So they're looking to have an informal chat by phone first to be able to schedule some sort of um, work between the two committees. Um, so would members be happy if I speak to them and then come back to you and update you on what it is that they would like to progress that and we can schedule something with them in the future? Yep. Okay, then page 160, item 10.7, there's correspondence from the Community Relations in School. Uh, regard, uh, schools regarding the urban villages and community in transition. Um, we do have a space. My memory is not going to allow me to remember when it was. So, Michael, I'm going to defer to your encyclopedic memory. When did we say we would have some space for them? On, on the 2nd of June, uh, because we have urban villages then and the letters about urban villages as well. 
Okay. So on the 2nd of June, we could also, uh, we have space for them because of the reorganization and that would allow us to have some uh, update from them. Would be, members be happy to receive that presentation from them? Okay. Chair, Chair, just can I say that I have been engaging uh, with this issue and the year to year funding has, uh, is really problematic. So just to support what, you, what you've been saying, but just to call out because they have been actually very good at alerting many of us to the problems that uh, they are receiving and trying to take the work that they're doing forward. Okay, certainly not a problem, Martina, and certainly they wrote to us on the back of engagement with yourself, and that's why we thought it would be good to get the, the presentation in where we had space from them. Uh, also, maybe just to let members know that we are fairly tight now between now and the summer recess, uh, but if there are members at areas where uh, our members would be interested in exploring, um, if they could let the, the clerk know before the end of June so that there's some time to schedule those into the autumn, but we're, we're fairly uh, tight with a couple of presentations each day now between now and the end of June. Okay, item 11 is any other business? Is there anything else that anybody wants to raise there? Can I come in, Chair? Um, it's just to understand, um, because I know it was um, one, one of the legislative procedures we were dealing with there, there with SRs, but the, the Complaint Standards Authority, um, when you mentioned uh, them coming before us, because there's a number of issues I would find probing there, um, are, is that on our schedule? Because when you talked about a packed agenda and whatever, because I thought we were going to be dealing with that today, I misunderstood. But um, I, I wouldn't mind an opportunity to, to some of and scrutinise some of that a bit further. Okay, uh, I'll bring Michael in there. Um, my, my understanding now is that the next stage is to engage with them regarding the statement of principles for going forward. So I presume that will involve us. What, what would be the process for that engagement, Michael? Uh, yes, I, I assume the, the ombudsman would come and meet the committee and talk about that statement of principles, and then, and then we would we would have a motion in the assembly to approve that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Okay, anybody else? Any other business? Okay, that allows us then for to say that that's the meeting concluded for today. And um, the date, time, and place of the next meeting will be next Wednesday at two o'clock and again virtually by um, Starleaf. So that's us all finished up, guys. Thank you very much indeed for uh, the meeting today. Okay, Michael, thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.